Thank you, guys. Um, I was here last year giving my first ever talk uh, at Lightning Talks round, um, last JS Unconf. So I'm really glad uh, that I can be here again this year and give this talk to you guys. And yeah, I'm uh, late to the Jimnu party. I will be concluding this party today. Um, so let's start. That's me. Um, I'm a developer at Jimdo. I am not a machine learning expert or a data scientist, data engineer. I'm neither of those. Um, I just did that uh, project in my free time because I wanted to. So if you have specific machine learning questions, please don't direct them to me. Uh, ask your local data engineer. Uh, you can uh, also reach me on Twitter, at Chimney42, uh, uh, GitHub, and if anyone's still on Google+, just check if I'm there too, I think so. Okay, so uh, let's start with a funny quote. Um, this is actually a former football player, and he said, I never predict anything, and I never will. So uh, neither am I. I already put the predictions up for this uh, match day, uh, today, tomorrow, yesterday. Um, I put them uh, on the backside of this wall, I think, and uh, I will be updating the results as they come in. I think the game will start in 15 minutes, so um, let's see how well um, my neural network actually does things. Okay, so uh, first things first, uh, we have to understand neural networks, and this will conclude some math, but I hope that most of you will get it, because it's really not that hard. But uh, let's look at neurons first. Those are naturally occurring uh, neurons too. And the snaky fuzzy stuff to the left are dendrites. Dendrites receive the input, then the neuron does stuff with it, sends a signal to the next dendrite via the axon, and then the whole thing is done again. And the very interesting thing about uh, neurons is that neurons who do, uh, which do one thing can learn to do another thing. So let's say those are neurons for seeing, and then the person uh, gets blind for some reason. So those neurons aren't useless now because they can learn to hear, for example. And they will just uh, get some input, do some stuff, and then just uh, send another signal to the next neuron, and it doesn't matter really what the signal is. So the thing, uh, how, it, uh, how neurons do that is by experience. So they, they get a lot of input over time and they, there's a lot of repetition and iteration and by, by that neurons learn to see the pattern or the logic um, behind things. So what neurons do need is a variety of training, training examples and that's the most important thing. So uh, let's look at an artificial network that is uh, a simple multi-layer network. We have three layers here. The first is the input layer. Um, that's where we receive our input. Then we have a hidden layer. Um, I just chose to have one hidden layer. It doesn't really matter. Uh, you can just um, try it out, what works for you. And then we have an output layer. So in, in this graph, the uh, arrows would be our dendrites or, or axons, and the circles would be our neurons. Okay, so let's look at it more closely. So in the first layer, we get our inputs, like I said. Uh, we call those X for the purpose of things. So we have three different inputs, three different features, X1 to X3. And um, if we look at the first neuron or the first layer, uh, we see that it uh, puts out three different values from the neuron. Um, so this is the math part I was talking about. I put a legend uh, to the side so you remember what I'm talking about. So x1 would be our input, and theta111 is just a weight. So theta in this case is a matrix. If you don't know what a matrix is, just imagine it as being some kind of JavaScript object, and the 111 would be the keys to access the value behind it. So I could just say x1 times a or whatever, po pony, unicorn. Um, and so then we send another signal, x1 times another weight, and then another. And the way that we choose theta here, the weight, uh, is actually that for our initial run, for the first iteration, we just choose it randomly. We, just, we don't know what the weight would be, and we just uh, initiate it randomly. Okay, so if we look at the first neuron, the hidden layer, and the second layer, then we see we get three different features multiplied with three different weights. 
So we get x1 times something, x2 times something, and x3 times something. So this neuron actually gets all the input with some weight, and then it just sums it all up. So it just adds the three input values, and then it does something activate. There's an, fu an activation function, and that is the magic that's happening. So there are different activation functions. I, I won't go into them because that takes a lot of math. Um, Important to know is just that we sum up all the input um, and then do stuff with it and then get to our new value, which would be A12. But again, this is just a value in a matrix, doesn't really matter uh, what it says. So the same thing actually also happens in our last layer, in our output layer. We receive our input, so we get now have A12, A22, and A32. And then again, some thetas, again, initially random, uh, randomly initialized. And then we get our last value, A13, which is just the sum of everything we have, and then we activate it with something. Okay, so what we have in the end is we have values, we do stuff with it, get new values, do, a, do stuff again, then get a third value. That is the result of our hypothesis. So our hypothesis is kind of like the model that we try to uh, build to represent the logic or the pattern we're trying to learn. And so what H theta of X actually means is like you put X's in, like X1, X2, X3 would be three um, values in a vector or an array if you want. And then so the function says, this is the logic that I think it's gonna be, and then we get our result. This would be a numerical value probably, and it's ideally really close to the reality, and the reality is called Y in this case. Okay, so um, there was really a lot, so let's pause with a funny quote. This is by George E.P. Box, and he says, all models are wrong, but some of them are useful. Okay, so let's say we did all that stuff with our neurons and we computed all the, those things with our magic activation function, and now we have a result. But the result is actually probably not that good, probably not that close to reality because we initialized theta randomly, so we just said, just do random stuff with it. Um, for this case, um, which is called supervised learning, because we have um, we have a, an output that we know is the truth, so we supervise our machine while it learns. And supervised learning is used for, for example, quota for betting places, the BWIN quota, that is uh, one where there's supervised learning. And also that is a really um, nice uh, example is housing price predictions. Um, where you say this is the square meters and this is the number of rooms and this is the price uh, amount of money that I have to pay for. And so you train your uh, neural network with stuff that you know is the truth. Um, there's also unsupervised learning. Um, that is, for example, the Netflix recom recommendation system. So there is no real answer that we, the people who build it, um, know about. We just say, Probably there's some pattern here, maybe you can try to figure it out. And uh, clustering is one of the most often used um, methods to, to do unsupervised learning. But I won't be talking about that, I will only to be talking about supervised learning. Okay, so like I said, we initialize theta randomly, and um, this could be an example of our training data. So we have four training examples. Um, let's just say this is uh, housing prices. So X1 would be the number of, uh, I don't know, square meters, and the other one would be the number of rooms, which is weird, but doesn't matter. So Xs are the inputs, Y is the result that we know it is, and H of X would be the result that our neural network just gave us. So as you can see, it's off, of course, because we just did it randomly. And the question now becomes is how do we actually uh, learn the correct patterns or the correct weights for um, our theta? So um, what we can do is calculate the cost. So we have our uh, output, uh, 60, and our y, which is 43. 
and the cost would be the difference between those two. And this cost is also described by another function, it's called j of uh, theta, doesn't really matter what you call it. It just means this calculates the difference between our result and uh, the actual thing that, um, the reality. Okay, so um, what we do now is we use a very complicated mathematical function and then we take our cost and then propagate back through our network, that's called back propagation, and uh, try to um, change the values for theta in a way that minimizes the cost because we want to, the error to be small, as small as possible, so we try to minimize j of theta. And the way that um, we do that with synaptic is called gradient descent. There are other ways and other functions uh, to actually do that, but um, I will only talk about gradient descent for now. So um, this is very complicated, so I'm trying to um, explain it in a very basic way. So let's say this is the graphical representation of our cost function. We have theta one, we have theta two. And uh, then we have a circle, which is j of theta. So what that means is that all the combinations of theta one and theta two that are on the circle uh, have the same value for theta, j of theta. So let's say the, 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 the bottom dot there uh, is um, theta one, uh, two, and theta two, one. That's not a very good example, but, uh, so th those would have the same value for j of theta, like the upper point where uh, theta one would be two and theta two would be four, maybe. Okay, and then if we calculate j of theta for a lot of combinations of theta one and theta two, we have something that looks like this. And the way you have to look at it is actually that there is a third dimension going into the back, which is j of theta. So the value of j of theta becomes smaller to the back. So imagine you're looking into a funnel. Now, we can see here that where the red dot is, that would represent the minimum, so where j of theta would be the smallest, and this is what we want to reach. And uh, what gradient descent does is now that, let's say the gray dot, I hope you can see it, yes, uh, the gray dot is where we come out initially. And gradient descent basically checks for the values of theta one and theta two that will get us closer to the minimum. It doesn't have to go there directly, sometimes it will wander around a little bit, but eventually it will try to reach the global minimum. It, it doesn't happen all the time, sometimes you just wander around it, um, but uh, you, you will reach the vicinity of it. And the size of the steps actually is uh, called the learning rate. You can change that rate, you can make the sizes bigger or smaller. Uh, usually the learning rate gets smaller the closer you are to the minimum. So what you can really see here is that the steps will get smaller um, the more you approach the red dot. Okay, um, <clears throat> that was a lot of theory. So let's implement something and you will see it's really not that hard. So uh, I use Synaptic because Synaptic does all that stuff that I showed you already and I don't really have to care about it. It's a framework to do exactly, uh, to then um, do stuff with the neural network and it gives us everything we need to build a simple network. Uh, we have an architect and the architect will build our network and then we have a trainer and that will train our network with the training examples that are not included. We have to provide them to, uh, for our um, uh, neural network, and we can make predictions uh, with our trained network by calling the function activate. Okay, code. I will give you a moment to parse it. So, um, I have two objects there. Uh, one is a historic match. It has an input array. Those are uh, market values for the team. I just thought that market values are a pretty good approximation of how strong a, t a team is, so I just chose that one, but feel free to choose anything else you want. And um, so the first is for the home team and the second value is for the away team. And if you always provide the home team first, then the neural network will also learn from that because that is also a pattern that it will pick up. Um, if there is something like a home team advantage, then maybe uh, our neural network will learn that. 
And then we have an output um, that is a vector or an array where we have basically three classifications. So the first value would mean the home team win if it's a one, if it's a zero, no. The second value says that it is a draw, and the third value would be that the away team wins. So we actually, we do three types of classifications, one for each of the possible outcomes. And in this example, the home team won because there's a one as the first value. Then we have the match in the future, which basically looks exactly the same, uh, just except that it doesn't have an output. That's logical because we want our neural network to give us the output. So then we have our training set that um, is consistent of the historic matches, and we have our network that is trained by the architect. A perceptron actually means the smallest possible network, which is just one neuron input and output, but it doesn't really matter. It could also say in it. Um, it's just the way that we build the network. And <clears throat> so we give um, the perceptron the number of nodes per layer. So first is uh, two, because we have two input values. Uh, I chose two hidden layers of six uh, nodes, but it doesn't really matter. You can just try it out. Um, actually, that's what I also did. I just tried out what, what seemed to work best. And then we have three nodes for our output layer because we have three values in our output. <coughs> uh, then we train our trainer with the training set. And um, I just chose a learning rate that you can see there. There's a learning rate, the, the steps that we take in gradient descent. And that is also something I just um, figured out with some trial and error. And then there is the number of iterations. So you say, I want to iterate through my whole training set 100,000 times in this case. And uh, after we trained our trainer, uh, our network, we can uh, actually make predictions. Like I said before, um, we give uh, our network the activations or the input with the um, uh, function called activate. And um, this is what the output could look like. So here um, you can see the activations, the inputs, the market values, um, and then the uh, output. And as you can see, uh, there's no output like 100001. This is a probability distribution. So all the values added up in this array will come to one. So there's a 100% possibility that one of those outcomes will happen. And then there's a distribution of how likely it is. So for the first one, you can see that the team who has 321.15 uh, euro, probably millions of euros, uh, will more likely win than the other team. Okay, this is a longer quote, and it's also a thinker, so take your time. Everyone got that? Good. Okay, so um, now we have our network, we have our output, it looks pretty good so far, but how do we know how well it performs? Um, I will explain some error rates that I personally focused on, but um, as when I try to learn how to improve my algorithm, but feel free to think, come up with uh, your own errors. It's just what I did. So there's something called the synaptic data error, and um, that is already provided with synaptic. And uh, I call it data error because it just, the name is error and I call it on the data object. And um, what we do here is we add a schedule to our trainer and uh, we tell him that every 10,000th iteration, I want to log the uh, current data error to the console. So this is bad. Um, okay, and this could be the output. And uh, in this case, you can see actually that the error actually goes down a little bit over time, uh, over iterations, and that is really, really good to see. And also, 18% is uh, also pretty good because we only give it our market values and this seems to perform pretty good. But um, the error doesn't really tell us anything. It doesn't really translate to anything that you can then interpret. So I thought I need to um, display a different error that was more of an intuitive uh, representation of how well my algorithm actually performed. So uh, what I did then is uh, uh, come up with something called the classification error. 
So, give you a moment to parse this. Okay, what I'm <coughs> doing here is in our do function, uh, for every 10,000th iteration, I want to actually make a prediction. Because now I only, have, first I only have the probabilities, but I don't actually say, so the home team's gonna win. So this is what I'm doing here, uh, the predict from probability function that you can see actually just looks for the key where the value is the biggest in the array. So um, if the home team won, this would be zero. If it was a draw, it would be one. And if it, uh, the away team won, it would be two. And then I just um, uh, look, uh, just make the prediction actually, and then do the same thing, and then compare whether the prediction um, actually met the expectation. Count up my errors, and then divide it uh, through the length of the training set. And what we actually see here is that the error rate is much higher with 45%. And this is actually what I had suspected, and I will probably tell you later why. Um, also, you can see that it doesn't continuously go down. It just seems to hover around 44%. But I still thought this really wasn't um, telling me how well my algorithm, perf algorithm performs because I make those predictions with a training set. So I already know about um, the data that I get in and then I make a prediction from it. It doesn't tell me anything about how well my algorithm performs for future predictions. So then I came up with a thing called the cross-validation error. And um, what I do there is actually first split the data set into a training set and then a cross-validation set. And the reason I do that is because I want the training data to only train my neural network. And then I take the cross-validation data, I act like it would be the future, and then check how well um, my algorithm performs. So um, I'm doing the exact same thing as I did before, just I make the predictions on the cross-validation set and not on the training set. Okay, so this is the output. And um, you can see that it seemed to perform even worse a little bit, but also there's something that I already suspected would happen. And um, what's weird is that it seems like the error rate goes up for at first and then goes down and then up again just like the error we saw before. So the question now becomes, why? What, what does this mean? What, what do these error rates tell me, actually? So the thing is, um, if we have one example where our result would be this probability distribution, and then we have the actual result, which would be this, 0, uh, zero, zero 001, so the awaiting one, what the data error gives us is uh, called the mean squared error. And um, the squared error is this. So what this means is um, the probability distribution would be a vector and we measure the, we get the length of the vector and then um, uh, to the power of two, which would come up to 0 0.98, about 0 0.98. And then the mean means we take all training examples, not just the one, and then calculate the average squared error. So probably the average would be somewhere close to 0 0.98. Let's say it, it's that. Now for a classification error, we only have uh, one because um, uh, you can either be 100% wrong or 100% right. There's no in-between, there's no probability. So in this case, our error would be just one. And also for a cross-validation error, it would be one, um, but still it's, it's logical that our uh, algorithm would perform worse with data it doesn't know about. It's just not in the experienced realm of the algorithm. Okay, so um, what does it actually mean when my cross-validation error is bigger or greater than my classification error? So that could mean that we have overfitted our model or have high vi variance, and I'm trying to explain that. Let's say this is our training data. So this uh, one is x1 and x2, we have two features, and this is uh, our training data, and now our model is the line there. So the model describes the training data pretty good, 
but maybe it's not that good for future predictions because um, it's really it just follows this ex exact model and um, it doesn't really generalize very well. And um, that is called overhit, overfit or high variance. And the other thing, the other uh, extreme would be if you have the same training uh, set and this would be your model. Uh, it's a straight line. It's, it doesn't fit so well on the existing training data, but it might perform better with future predictions than the one on the left. And that is called underfit or high bias. So um, what we maybe can do is try to get more data or more features. So either get more historical data, go to uh, the last year, the year before that, also get the data from, I don't know, uh, Premier League or uh, Super League or whatever. Or we can do some, uh, or we can get more features like the uh, match day or the table position or I don't know the number of uh, sexy coaches in the team. And um, then there's this other thing called regularization. And uh, that is basically another parameter that we add to our cost function. Uh, um, yeah, no, to the gradient descent function, I'm sorry. And um, what it actually does is uh, trying to keep the thetas as small or big as possible. It depends really on what, you, what value you choose for your regularization parameter. Um, if you think uh, about the uh, model I showed you before, um, keeping the theta small would mean to straighten out the line and making it big would mean to curve the line more. So this is how you could counteract overfitting or underfitting. And uh, also the hovering that we saw before, that the error rates seem to hover around a number but never seem to get anywhere, could, could mean that we actually already reached our minimum, it's just not very optimal. So maybe it's just we're not that, we didn't describe our feature pretty, go, uh, pretty well. So, <coughs> sorry. What I actually did is um, I chose to go with more features. And um, I want to show you what happened. So I, uh, this is for the market values. You can see the error rates. It's kind of basically what we saw before. And now I have two f uh, five features, um, match day, the market values, and then the uh, table positions. And um, now we can try to interpret. There seems to be something that is going, that is a little bit better. Other things seem to be a little bit worse. But uh, I personally decided that the uh, variation in numbers is just too little to really read anything into it. So the only thing that that really told me was that investing time and maybe money in getting more features might not be that beneficial because it just doesn't have that effect on the error rates um, that I hope it would be uh, would have. So my next step would just be to try get more data and see what it does to my error rate. <coughs> So another funny quote, prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. And as you saw, not even for the future, just for the faked future, just for the present, it's not that uh, easy at all. Uh, yeah. Okay, so now you hopefully know how neural networks do their magic and how to implement a machine learning algorithm with synaptic and you don't even have to do all the math stuff, just go and do stuff then you might have learned how to check the performance of your algorithm and how to interpret your error rates. So before I said I would make a prediction for this match day, and uh, I did. I already gave this talk yesterday to, uh, at Jimlu so they can actually vouch that I made this prediction. And uh, I got the first game right already, that's awesome. Um, like I said, I had the predictions uh, over there and you can check for yourself how well my algorithm actually performs. I'm using data from the last four years of the Bundesliga, so it's really not that good. Um, depending on the error rate, it's probably worse than a coin toss, maybe. Okay, <laughs> if you wanna know more, um, the first link would be to the repository. It's called Positronic Brain. Every Star Trek watcher should laugh now. Okay, no one, fine. Um, the second link is to the slides. I will also tweet them and then you can just check it out. Sorry for the slide mess up. I don't know what happened there. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, then there's uh, this funny 
page called Coding Games, where it's actually super fun. You can code for fun there, and they have a machine learning section now. And there's stuff you can read about, and there's also the link, uh, the second one, to Synaptic, the framework. So check it out. I highly recommend it. And uh, finally, I want to thank um, PyMaster, who's not here. He's actually my boyfriend, and he helped me with implementing a lot of uh, data parsing stuff. Um, Transfermark, we crawled our data from their page, and I don't really ask them, I just did. Um, also, I want to thank Jimdu for providing me the time and the resources to actually do that, and of course, all of you for your interest. Thanks a lot. Yeah.